Uh, I wanted to, one last thing I wanted to talk about today for today's ep- episode was like uh, how we name diatonic intervals and how these how these like diatonic intervals are also used for like, interval categories and other like tunings and scale types like Edo like. We have diatonic categories based on 12 Edo diatonic, like major third, meaning 400 cents or maybe five before sometimes, and super major third being 97, and the major second being around 200 cents, and minor second being around a semitone, 100 cents. Uh, well, I think like there's some, th- that's kind of, that's kind of an issue when you're working with really like soft diatonic like uh, like thirty three edos five to four hardness diatonic or thirty two edos very hard six to one diatonic. In thirty three edo, um, the major third is a sub major third of the so called major third is a sub major third of 364 cents, and meanwhile in 32 Edo, it's an aotic of 450 cents. And the minor second, with minor seconds, it's even worse because it's it's far further out in the fifth chain. In 33 Edo, it's 145 cents, and in 32, 32 Edo, it's 37.5 cents. I wish people I wish more people would talk about how 32 and 33 as diatonic tunings are these like incredible radical extremes in terms of hardness and softness but they're just right next to each other. In fact, I was uh, notating something in a tuning, one of those I think for somebody the other day and I got it mixed up like which one was which and was just devastated. So it's like very it's very poignant. It's a good observation to make about the equal temperaments I think. The point I was gonna make was like how like major third in di- the concept di- the major the, the major third calling the, the term major third is overloaded now meaning both the major two step in the diatonic mass and the interval category of like th- three hundred eighty six to about four hundred fifty about 14 to 11 ish including 400 cent in the middle and uh, yeah it's both anyway both me the point out was it's both a diatonic structural cat structural like uh term and an interval category melodic interval category term and that's kind of that kind of inconvenient for a lot for a, num- a lot of reasons so that's and my proposed solution is to you extend extend the zero index zero index team names name for diatonic using the prefix dia. So we'll call the diatonic major third the major two dia step. I think this is a really good system, and I plan to use it on my own. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I I get the the reason behind it, but at the same time, uh, we kind of still need to be. Um, I think uh, the the terms that we use uh, should be easy to understand for for non Zen musicians. Yeah, like immediately understandable and most of the time uh, it is easy to yeah that's that's an uh, important distinction and i guess it may confuse someone so like if someone like listens to some uh, uh, theoretical ramblings about just intonation and uh, he here's like uh four over uh, five over four to be referred as uh major third like and thinks ah okay so five over four is like uh 
the the meaning the actual meaning behind major third and then he goes on and like learns something about uh, uh mos scales uh and yeah i guess i guess uh there are several different meanings for <laughs> the word combination major third but at the same time i guess most of the time it is uh, quite easy to get which of these meanings is used from the context i'm gonna have to disagree with you i think that this system is a distinction that's absolutely worth making because Different diatonic scales have very different interval categories for the same number of generators. That's the point I was making with the 32 Edo versus 33 Edo example. Right. I think this is absolutely a distinction that's worth making, and I don't think that it comes at the expense of understanding. Because when people are coming into Zen, they think that the major third is just the major third. They don't think about it in terms of generator chains. They just think of interval quality. So if someone is starting to learn about MOS scales, they can just learn the new terms. Yeah. Hey friends, I think I'm going to go now because it is really late here. So it's like 11.25 p.m. Anyways, before I go, I uh, yeah, just wanted to announce it to the audience as well because we discussed it in the you know in the break that uh, <clears throat> I'm basically going to uh, as the artist of the you know logo of uh, Zender Garden that you may be able to see on the YouTube video and other places. Basically, I'm prob I'm thinking of um, working on other you know. Um, other logos and um, other, not logos, but other artworks, you know, for the Zender Garden podcast. So, yeah, I hope you are prepared to see them because I'll make like posters and uh, other stuff. Yes, I'm very excited. Thank thank you for being willing and to jump in and contribute so amazingly to this podcast. Oh, no way. worries. I love this podcast. Use lots of crayons. <laughs> yeah. Use lots of crayons. <laughs> I need to add crayons as well. Uh, also, one last thing before I go, I am working on a YouTube series, which is for teaching new people to Zen harmonic theory. So like concepts like just intonation, equal temperaments and MOSs, MOSs, of course, uh, and other stuff. Maybe like to go into um, more, you know, specific um, lessons. I'm going to add like, you know, there's like just intonation. So like the harmonic series, episode two, uh, just intonation and intervals. I don't know the subharmonic series, episode two point one. And you know, it's like um, subgroups of episode. So if we want, if like for some instance, I uh, want to uh, make a video, what are limits in just intonation? This will be like two point something. You know, because it's like gonna be a part of the just intonation saga. That's that's really epic. I I think um Zotla did a similar kind of series about explaining different things. But I mean yeah. like, it's yes. it's good. I think it's good to have like a like just like spam YouTube with a bunch of different kinds of intro to zen type videos so we can like learn it in like different styles and like different ways and maybe different Definitely. kinds of those introductions will get different kinds of people um interested in zen. The world absolutely needs more of a diversity of Zen content. And exactly. as a matter of fact, I am also working on some. Ooh, interesting. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to hear that. I'm the I'm the kind of cringe one here because all I'm doing is making like this weird crossover between Zen content and pony content. Hey, don't worry. You guys already saw a um, Mirship Groove, my YTP MV of Starship Groove, which isn't Zen, but I wanted to make one for um, Starfish. I talked about this in the last episode. I don't know if I yeah, still want to do it, but I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I also was working on, like, have you guys ever seen, like, these MIDI art pieces where, like, the MIDI itself actually creates really good music? 
Yes. Yep. Okay, so a long time ago, I was actually making one for um, Superstar Saga's uh, channel icon, but I never released it. I was talking a bunch to uh, Steven about it, actually, because I wanted, like, to collaborate with him on it, but I ended up doing most of it anyway, and um, I never finish it, but I should. But another thing I did is I was uh, working on a mini art piece for Twilight Sparkle in 22 Edo, which is probably the weirdest thing you guys have ever heard, and, like, probably two people will get it. But, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm the dude that brings bronies to microtones. Who knows? Zroni gang gotta rise up. <sighs> Microbrones. Microbronality. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. I just wanted to say that I'm not, like, totally against uh, specific naming for uh, uh, MLS-based uh, intervals. Uh, to be honest, to be, to be honest, my attitude towards uh, all like uh, proposition towards like some new terms is well, w whatever sticks in the end is good. Like time would tell. That's how I feel about it, too. I feel like, you know, unfortunately, um, popular appeal will win the day in terms of what terms gets used, uh, even if they're just absolutely terrible. I think something would have to be really, really functionally awful in order for me to be like, we have to change this so that people use it differently. You know, you use the term differently and all of that stuff. Um, but it definitely, that doesn't make it any less important for us to... Uh, lay the groundwork um, and try and make sure that when people start using these terms that uh, they start with something good. Like, um, has anyone here seen Levi McLean's videos? I have not. Nope. So Levi is really popular on TikTok and um, there was a video he did about uh, 31 notes in microtonality and uh, I found that he used a diagram that I made which is really exciting that like some diagram I made is in a video with like a million views or whatever. Um, but that's a great example of like someone coming in and starting this for the first time and then just like finding these things on the wiki and having to make sense of them. Um, so like, you know, if you make the, if you make the right diagram, if you say the right term, um, you know, microtonality is ripe for uh, virality and it might be included somewhere in the discourse. Yeah, makes sense. One thing I wanted to say about, um, like, having different interval categories and kind of fixing the way we think of interval categories, I think one of the, like, difficult facts about doing Zen harmonic music is that, like, the diatonic interval categories are just so annoyingly useful that it's hard to base your music on different kinds of interval categories. And also the fact that, like, 12 Edo is such an annoyingly good tuning that it's hard to convince a lot of normal people that other tunings shine too. Because, like, 12 Edo has its limitations. But, like, there's a reason that it became, like, basically the only tuning that most people are aware of. Annoyingly good is such an excellent way to describe 12 Edo. It is also very hard to go away from like uh, heptatonic uh, logic in general. Even if you like force yourself to switch from 5L to S, you kind of most of the time uh, still uh, in one way or another uh, base your uh, composition, your logic uh, in terms of uh, heptatonic scales. Even even if you're not, uh, if you if you're trying to hide it through your own composition, you still a lot of the time still uh, think heptatonically, and uh, I've spent a lot of time to try to force myself onto like decatonic logic because I think that's another one that can be really useful like 10 Edo is actually is actually really really great 
but it is a die cut. <laughs> If, if it weren't uh, tempering out 25 or 24, it would be excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, you can say s the same thing about 7 Ido. It would be great, it would be really great if it <laughs> weren't tempering out 25 over 24. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why... Uh, uh, haptotonic logic is so comfortable because it puts uh, 6 over 5 and 4 over... 5 over 4 into the same c category. And the same is true for... for decatonic stuff. So your <coughs> quote-unquote thirds are still in the one <laughs> quote-unquote bucket of intervals. Da I freaking love 7 Edo regardless. But I'm look, I'm I'm user minus 1 7 Edo pilled. I I'm addicted to 7 Edo. I don't know why. It sounds so insanely good to me and I cannot put my finger on it. 29 over 16 has been my favorite interval for a long time and it's six steps of 7 Edo. 43 over 32 is another interesting interval I like. That is very close to three steps of 7 Edo. Something about the heptatonic yet equal logic that 7 Edo uses hits my brain in a way that no other tuning does. I would never, I would not use 7 Edo for the rest of my life, but something about it always hits my brain in this weird way, and I cannot explain it. It's almost driving me crazy because I don't understand why my brain likes it so much. I am not a 7 Edo person, but I have experienced a little bit of what you're feeling. Yeah, that 7 Edo feeling is great. Um, I have to ask, um, well, when I first started getting into microtonality, before I really untwelved myself, like, I would listen to music in 7 tone equal temperament, and my brain would, like, illusorily, like, in an illusion-based way, I should say, it would try to make... I would think that the chords were major or minor for a while until I really learned to listen in. Is that a feeling that any of you have had? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I even thought that uh, the interesting approach with uh, 7 Ido might be uh, writing uh, something. I, I, I will always, uh, I should say that I always wanted to do it. And I never actually tried to, but I always thought that this would be a good idea, and I think one day I will do it. Is writing uh, a composition and in seven Ido, and then uh, trying to perform it. I sh I think to sing it, to sing it would be the best way, but trying to. Uh, harmonize with other voices depending on like uh, your intuition while still uh, kind of sticking to what is written in 7 Edo I think that would lead to some interesting results I have a real life example of that actually I have a real life example of that I um I, I haven't really posted this in any of my uh, like albums and things, but I have a SoundCloud account, um, and one of the early pieces I wrote when I was still in school is a piece that I learned how to sing in seven tone equal temperament and play on dulcimer in one day, <laughs> um, to the great annoyance of the choral director, uh, because I was just practicing loudly on my dulcimer singing in seven tone equal temperament, which he considered out of tune maybe, um, but he knew you know that it was a real thing. It was just loud, um, so. That piece is, I think, death-giving monolith, yes. And there was a part in it where I sing a neutral third from seven tone equal temperament slightly too high on a certain cadential note. Um, and so I drop, like I, I cheated, I went into the software and I just tuned those two sections like 15 cents inward each so that it would sound like the same note when I like jumped to another part and played it instead of sounding like two different notes. Um, and that is a, 
a very classic example of something I like to do in my microtonal covers, which is purposely sing certain notes uh, inaccurately to see if the purists ever complain, um, which they don't. <laughs> You're not doing it for any reason other than to make people mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm also doing it for the humanity. Um, but I'm glad you asked. It's, um, I feel like it's important to have these little discrepancies in certain musical environments. It it adds to the flavor, it adds to the color, and it puts you in a situation where you start to treat the tunings you're using like lots of people treat 12 tone equal temperament. That should be the end goal. Yeah, I think it's like, you know, people should be okay with accepting other frameworks and then deviating slightly from that framework in a way they would play music, like I think. Uh, like probably treating other tunings like we treat 12 EDO will will help people to realize that we're not just like being pretentious about it or like overly or like trying to be overly accurate in a way that excludes them or or whatever. That is a really good way of thinking, but I also just really like the order of pure equal temperaments. Oh yeah, me That's too. That's why I haven't gotten into well temperaments. It's just I just love how all of the notes are the same. And how it is so simply mathematically defined. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's just a certain number of divi of equal logarithmic divisions of a just interval. I love defining things simply. That's like what I do with swing music. I don't set a percentage for swing. I either use triplet swing or soft or hard quintuplet swing or soft or hard or near equal septuplet swing. Not near equal, near vanishing. What I what I've what I've I've tried to name all of the different types of swing and what I came up with was vanishing for like extremely hard swing that's basically not even useful so uh, for vanishing septuplet swing it would be six to one uh, ratio for the for the beats one thing I wanted to say why I think that composing in seven Edo and just trying to sing it uh, while harmonizing with other voices uh, might be interesting because uh, I have this it's not a problem it's more like a strange little thing when I hear a 7 Ido neutral triad and uh, I try to sing it I sing it and it comes out uh, as a neutral triad. I repeat and it comes out as a neutral triad. Then my brain gets uh, disabled and I sing a, a major third, uh, a major triad, like automatically. That's why I think it would be interesting because I feel like if I actually try to do uh, so to sing a seven either piece. Uh, without trying to stay uh, true uh, to t as true to seven either as possible i would just uh there would not be any n neutral tri uh, triads i think <laughs> there would be major and minor triads all over the place and it would be interesting to see uh if i did so without like trying to analyze and think where should I put a major triad, where should I put a minor, if I just like let it flow, it is very interesting for me to see where I would automatically sing a major triad and where would I sing a minor one. It would be it would be really cool to hear a piece that made use of the contrast between 7 EDO and 10 EDO neutral triads, which both have a really different character. Yeah, that's true. One quick thing, uh, and I really want to do the same experiment with 10 EDO, and I, if I had to guess, uh, I think that uh, the uh, trying to do so with 10 EDO would lead to a more interesting results because in 10 EDO kinder automatically distinguishes between pental and septimal stuff. So you would not, uh, like for example, uh, mm, 
neutral seventh uh if i play like neutral seventh uh court in seven edo i'm not sure how i would automatically uh, like uh, uh change it uh by singing to maybe to major seventh chord maybe to minor maybe to harmonic seventh one with uh 10 EDO, uh, the harmonic seventh uh, chord is like literally not uh, the same thing as the uh, best approximation of the best approximation of harmonic seventh chord is it's literally the different thing from the best approximation of minor seventh chord despite 25 over 24 being tempered out because 36 over 35 is not tempered out so you were talking earlier about wanting to break out of heptatonic logic in various tunings, specifically you mentioned 10 Edo. While I can't help with the 10 Edo problem, I have found that semi-chordal is one of the best scales for breaking out of heptatonic logic because it very solidly has either a five-note logic or nine-note logic. And sure, you can take a seven-note subset, which is basically... Uh, what you would kind of get if you swung the generator a bit, like with diasem, you know, it's 5L, 2M, 2S, and the 5L, 2M are kind of the heptatonic logic of that scale. But for semi-chordal itself, it is very solidly nine-note logic, and that's one of the things I really love about that scale. Yes, me too. Semi-chordal is another good one. Like, I would even say, like, uh nine Edo logic itself is uh, a solid possibility uh but uh, and and i tried to force uh, like nine logic uh, upon me as well and even kind of succeeded uh with like different uh temperaments that are really suited to nine uh, it the uh, logic like the i don't remember how it's called the 19 the one that that is supported by 9 10 19 29 this one negri uh yeah negri negri yeah yes, you're right i used i used that scale in bridge over troubled water um and i plan to use it a lot more as well and in my uh bob dylan 19 tone cover yeah it is great and uh despite it uh it this temperament being supported by 10 either it is pretty much like uh it is pretty much uh, it is mostly uh uh when you use it, you mostly use it with like nine uh, tone scales because they are just better. Well, I actually prefer using Negri with 10 note scales because then the major chord and the minor chord are the same number of steps in the 10 note scale, but not in the nine note scale. Yeah. I just. F I don't know. For me, for me, little Negri is more of a nine thing. But yeah, I guess you 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 can like view it through like ten note logic. The reason I chose to specialize in thirteen edo over eleven edo was that like for the because eleven edo had eleven edo's quasi diatonic masses. Had, was a seven note mass of my tonics were all three years while eight of those uh, quasi diatonic is five L three S and five L one S uh, sorry six L one S but five L three S is more like more quite interesting and also it's an eight note scale rather than a seven note one but okay. I think harmonically I basically uh, I had another time most of it out now, but melodically I had, I I think melodically it's like a, a bit less accessible for newcomers than 11 Edo's my tonic would be. 
Yeah, a Nyrotonic is really interesting, but I've never been able to get into it. I want to write in it anyway, but it, it's so hard for me right now. Also, um, Steven, I'm so sorry. I have a confession to make. Go, confession time. <laughs> On many occasions, I have been legitimately bothered by your lack of accuracy in, like, your covers, and I didn't know it was purposeful, but I never said anything because I didn't want to, s I didn't want to be that guy, and I didn't want to, um, I, I didn't want to be a hater, and I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings, and I was also confused about, like, why it wasn't more accurate, because I know you have perfect pitch, but now that I realize you put the inaccuracies in there on purpose, now I see things completely differently. Well, another thing that's <laughs> that's entirely possible is... That's not hating, though. That's being honest. You should have said that. Yeah, there's. It, it's totally possible that there's um, situations where I'm not as accurate, and it's not intentional. And then there's some situations where there is intentionality, and usually the intentional situations are tied to things like text painting. Um, like, for example, uh, in my Domi and JD Beck cover, um, I purposely sing the word lift... Uh, as a flat fifth instead of a sharp fifth in 17 tet. It's like a reverse text painting thing, right? Because normally a lifted fifth, I don't know, would be higher, but I sing it lower instead. So, like, things like that. So. Dang, you really put in a reverse switchy swatchy. <laughs> reverse switchy swatchy. <laughs> a swatchy switchy. <laughs> An interesting case of that is um, my Ebb Tide video in 13 tet. Um, seems like I'm singing along to the pitches, but I made that in like two seconds. Uh, Yuhani Nurvala commented that the I'd sing a chord that sounds like it could pass as something like a harmonic seventh, but the fifth is not actually close in 13 tet. Um, and so I figured out that only like two pitches were like a little wrong. Not really wrong enough to care on their own, but like if they both point a certain direction like 15 cents in, you get something that sounds more concordant. So, you know, I, a, a lot of those, if there is inaccuracy in the videos, I, it's usually not something that is really, like, I guess I, I'd want to say that, like, categorically, the notes still sound like they should sound in most cases. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Uh, you know, going back to how 12 can be a framework that is then interpreted, um, but to then consider, you know, be it an equal temperament or whatever you are working on, uh, to then take kind of creative performance liberties to reinterpret them. I think that's You know, fantastic. one thing that just, this just now occurred to me, I think the reason why a lot of Zen musicians view sticking to tunings as this very precise thing, whereas a lot of 12 veto musicians view 12 veto as being kind of something you very loosely stick to, is because a lot of Zen musicians use synthesizers to get those microtones, and these synthesizers tune things perfectly by default. So it just makes the most sense to stick with that, because in that case, it's harder to add, like, tuning variation than it is to actually stick to the tuning. Whereas in real life, with a lot of real instruments, it's the other way around. It's harder to stick yeah. to the precise stuff and easier to have that natural variation. But since I got yeah, into absolutely. microtones, I discovered that I actually prefer a lot of, like, um, uh, electronic, like, musical effects and stuff to, um, like, actual music performed with real instruments. Because, like, Sevish was the first microtonals that I listened to, and I think I just got addicted to, like, the whole sort of style of drum and bass, how you have these drums that are sped up, but they're really groovy, and you, they, they feel really digital, but in a good way, and then you have these synths that create, like, um, that create, uh, like, more complex sounds and, like, more, like, alien sounds than you could get in real life, and also the idea of, like, putting, like, the most random samples in music, like, I love when artists do that, they just put, like, random samples, to me it almost feels like it's, like, a, a, a little easter egg, it's, like, a little reference to something that a listener might be able to pick up on, or it, yeah. even, it's even cooler sometimes when the reference is something 
that only the um, artist will get. For example, like in Orange Arion, I sampled a conversation of my friends where one of them jokingly asked what color is seven and another said it's orange. And I sampled that and I kind of chopped their vocals around. And um, yeah, you mentioned that in the last of these. Yeah, but I'm, I'm mentioning mm -hmm. it again because I, I think it's interesting how like like I'd be the only one who would get that reference and pick up on that. Everyone else would just think that it's kind of like interestingly tuned vocals. I don't even know if most people can tell what they're saying, but I try to like add spectral processing to make sure that it's clear enough to where you can hear it because the original is kind of noisy. One of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, was this comment that 11 Edo Smytonic and 13 Ed is more accessible to newcomers than 13 Edo and Irotonic. And I don't know if I really agree with that because, I mean, from a melodic perspective, I see them as pretty similarly accessible because it's just taking a diatonic scale and adding an extra half step either by converting a step that exists or adding one in from a harmonic perspective i think it's pretty similar if you want to use 11 ito's best fifth obviously there isn't really much of a fifth in 11 or 13 ito but when i use the semitonic scale i use the one that comes from generally diatonic thinking which is the approximately 14 over 9, quote-unquote, fifth. It's very, very sharp. But if you, if you wanted to use the best fifth, you would have to uh, use a, diff a bit of a different non-diatonic way of thinking. That's the exact same thing that happens in 13 Edo. You could use the flat fifth that comes from the diatonic way of thinking, or you could construct chords that use the fifth that is the generator, which is more accurate, but doesn't follow from diatonic thinking as easily. So I actually see those two scales as very similar. Someone needs to make um, a three-step scale that combines metonic and a rhino and a, a nyrotonic. <laughs> a rhinotonic. <laughs> a rhinotonic. I showed um one of my students um an eight note uh microtonal scale, um Porcupine Eight, and now he likes Dolores Catherino. Um, he's also he's a student who, um, he has special needs. Um, and when he comes in to play piano, um, he likes to just like play and hold like random white notes to kind of like calm him down and so recently i've been turning the pitch wheel as he does that and he just loves it um and then i showed him one of dolores Catherino's videos and he like freaked out and he was like how does she do that so it was just really fun and and wholesome um he also loves pokemon um and so it, he has to take a little mental break and so he'll just google pokemon uh on sarah b well while he takes that and so it's uh it's a good time so i'm um, it's fun that he likes uh microtonality too i also have a guitar player in my saturday band who likes uh microtonality he'll detune since he knows i like microtonality he'll detune one of his strings on purpose um very slightly so that to get me to try and notice and it's funny <laughs> wait this this reminded me of something um on one of the Now and Zen episodes, the, the other microtonal podcast, this one's better, by the way, um, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was the one with Sevish, Benjamin, and Zotla. I wish I could get all three of them on here, but I don't think they'd be willing to. But um, I think one of them mentioned, like, Pokemon tunings or something, and I thought that was really fun. I want to extend that to just, like, cartoon characters associated with tunings. What cartoon character and tuning like, associations do you guys have or do you guys think would make a lot of sense sonic with what tuning <laughs> do you associate sonic i just wanted to bring up sonic <laughs> <laughs> not entirely related to the conversation <laughs> makes sense yeah i just wanted to bring up sonic 
Man, I've never even thought about that question. My head is just like exploding. Hmm. It, it's funny because a lot of um, there there's a lot of like weird coincidences where the name of a tuning or or usually a temperament is also the name of a co- cartoon character. For example, Luna is a temperament and a cartoon character. I'm sure you guys can guess which cartoon Luna's from. Is it the one with the ponies? Yes, it is My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Sonic is Porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Thank you. Yeah, that's another thing. Even if they're not exactly the same name, a lot of them, there's a lot of very obvious associations you can make, which I think is so funny. What about Hedgehog for Sonic? There's Hedgehog Temperament. Yeah, yeah. there's Hedgehog Temperament. Oh, yeah, that's even better than. So when you mentioned which cartoon Luna was from, it made me think of another animated Luna that is spelled with O's. And I thought, well, microtonalists love making regular temperaments that are almost indistinguishable, like porcupine and porcupine. So I thought, well, shoot, now I have to invent a temperament called Luna, but it's spelled with O's instead of a U. Porky mm-hmm. pig for, for porcupine. All the uh, Greek <laughs> uh, people should be cartoon characters in some kind of series so they can all get their own tuning. Like Socrates needs to get his own tuning, Archimedes, etc. Yeah. We're going to have two equal temperaments. One of them's called Socrates and the other one's called Socrates. <laughs> it's spelled the same. You just you just have to guess. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, somebody somebody should make a Zarlino scale. Different from the Zarlino scale. No. Actually, going back to like cartoon characters and temperaments, I guess I have one like association that one line that I can draw. Uh, mod by and uh, two EDO. I that guess. is actually amazing. Yeah, and like not in a bad way, <laughs> strangely. But I feel like yeah, th- there is a strong connection between mod by and two EDO, at least in my mind. I just had a crazy th- thought that. Uh, I'm ready to go. I really wanted uh, to uh, get, not like uh, really, really, but I had this idea that it would be cool for me to get on the Now and Zen podcast, like to talk, to be uh, on one podcast with Steven Weigel. And it's just occurred to me the moment he left that, well, while it is not Now and Zen, like, hey, I'm here. I'm on podcast with Steven Weigel <laughs> right now. I need to stop letting myself get interrupted because there was something that I still wanted to talk about with Steven before he left. It was this statement from, geez, it's got to be like over an hour ago at this point, that he doesn't like to go below the lowest F on the piano, I believe. And I think that's interesting because I use those notes all the time. I think that they sound especially good in tunings with uh, in instruments with very bright harmonics. For example, uh, slapped bass or piano is a good example. And that's why when I use the especially low string on my bass, which goes below the lowest note on the piano, I always slap that string when I play it pretty much all. Pretty much always. Mm. Yeah, that that is interesting. But I, I wanted to say, like, who has never, ever wanted to be on Now and Zen with Steven Weigel? Because I've wanted to do that forever. And I think this podcast is a good enough substitute for that. Because like Dead Shaman said, I did end up getting to be on a podcast with Steven Weigel. This whole podcast was a ploy to get all of us to be on a podcast with Steven Weigel <laughs> because he'd never invite any of us to now and Zen normally unless we like did something epic. 
I don't have enough material on the internet publicly available in order to feel comfortable going on a podcast like now and then same yeah that's how i feel steven's actually invited me regarding some of the instrument building things um specifically this like what i was calling the zen accord um and i just have been postponing that um out of more respect to potential listeners of like i don't i don't need to bore you all with this uh like half-baked project but Together, we add up to one now and Zen guest. <laughs> uh, you're right, Zero Mix. I, I think you would make a great now and Zen um, guest member, Richie. I, I, I am looking forward to the episode that you appear on, even though I might not understand all of the instrument building jargon. But I also oh, agree thanks. with Ground that I don't feel like I have enough music that I've released to feel like I have enough of a background to speak on in terms of now and Zen. I mean, I had totally. the music, the Muse score era. It doesn't really count. It wasn't actual production. It was just kind of basic composition, throwing things around, bullcrapping and tomfoolery here and there. <laughs> Steven should just invite like 20 of us at once. <laughs> <laughs> Recreate the chaos moment. Okay. That we had. Uh, I will totally agree with user minus one. Reach, I guess. Uh... I think that you would be a great guest uh, on Now and Zen podcast. Like, well, thank you. That's very sweet. I, I just need to get on my, my stuff and finish this project. And I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's one of those instances. I think it's kind of like making any work of art, which maybe some of you can relate to, of this feeling of like, oh, it will never be complete, of being too much of a perfectionist to let it just go. So it's, I'm kind of, uh, always in you know work in progress purgatory um, yeah that's me all the time i'm sitting on probably like a hundred songs that are yeah, almost same. finished <laughs> yeah and now in, like now that i've started procrastinating writing music with making instruments it's just adding to the purgatory pile um which so goes i guess that would be a good name for this episode the purgatory pile <laughs> <laughs> that I that would be a good name. Um, try <laughs> having perfectionism and being an extreme overthinker and being easily disappointed and having bad time management and having such an absurd hyper focus on My Little Pony French Biz Magic that it actually interferes <laughs> with your ability to be a competent Zen musician. Yeah, f f judging by the fact that you've brought it up three separate times in this podcast, I think it's oh, fair to say that least. you probably have an issue. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just part of my personality to lean to extremes. Either I say nothing about it, and then all of a sudden a, f a switch flips on, and then I start saying everything about it. I can relate to that a little bit. I was joking. <laughs> oh. That's another thing. I can't tell when people are joking or not a lot of the time. Sometimes I can't. I feel but... like I am especially bad when it comes to you not being able to interpret when I'm joking. Don't worry about it. It's it's just like the um, the, the car crash social interaction that um, Sevish mentioned on episode 54 of Now and Zen. Another of my hyper focuses is like Now and Zen episodes that feature Sevish. What was the car crash social interaction? Um, it, like, Sevish was trying to explain, like, something, and then he said he probably misused the terminology. And then, like, he actually said sometimes he enjoys the sort of awkward interactions that happen between people on the Zen server just because we can't all figure out what we're talking about and stuff like that. Absolutely. I think we're such a, a community so... Uh, hyper specific yet also prone to misread <laughs> and because likely we're wrapped up in our hyper specific language and how we are trying to communicate what it is we're trying to say um, it ends up being kind of awkwardly cumbersome yeah that's why I think we should like always provide diagrams to what we are saying like like always like actually always <laughs> <laughs> because uh, with diagrams, it is it is way easier to see 
what are you <laughs> referring to? And that's why I like almost insisting on adding diagrams to the previous uh, episode of the podcast. And I provided diagrams for all the technical parts that uh, I said. That's awesome. I mean, this is also coming from the shamanic master of diagram making. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I always appreciate when someone shares things visually, as that helps me so much. To be honest, I did like only like five or six like big diagrams that everyone were really hyped about, but they're literally not as much diagrams by me as <laughs> one can imagine. We are diagram masters. <laughs> and I will always done like, all of my diagrams are not that uh, complicated, not that unheard of. They are just like bigger versions of, most of the time they're just bigger versions of diagrams that have had been done before bigger or more like uh more wide to if this makes sense so like uh yeah vast i i'm referring to one diagram that is basic which is basically a, a version of saga's old diagram but he did diagram just for one region i guess for like for diatonic stuff, so like for 5L2S, and I've seen it and I've immediately, immediately thought to myself that it is possible to make uh, the same diagram for all possible generator ranges. And I did one, and everyone <laughs> was super hyped about it, and I still don't get why. One of the things that I'm planning to do some work on is creating pretty much a diagram making workspace, because what I do to make my diagrams is I use JavaScript. I use the SVG library in JavaScript. And so having something that would make it easier to add lines and shapes without having to just guess the coordinates and do some trial and error would be really useful to me. I too used JavaScript for my MOS charts. Yeah, JavaScript SVG is very underrated, I think. Well, I use processing, uh, which is kind of Java dialect. What I wanted to say, someone yes, had... P5JS. Basically, it, it, the same thing, yeah. P5JS and processing. Just one of them is for Joe, the other one for JavaScript. Okay, what I wanted to say, uh, someone had a great idea that all of my diagrams would be way better if they were interactive. Well, if I um, one day um, may make them interactive yeah then i would be like the greatest dead shaman of all dead shamans the master <laughs> of diagrams <laughs> and yeah if, if i actually <clears throat> did them like made them interactive i i would like totally agree with like all the praises and stuff that's right a now. really cool idea. There should be more like interactable like Zen web applications and stuff like that. For example, um there was this one web app that a guy um what's his name? Frostburn made that is a um kind of this projective tuning space game where like you ha you start with like three different Edos and you can like click on two of them to add a line between them that makes a temperament <laughs> like a line of temperaments and then when the lines intersect you get more Edos that you can click on 
And fun fact, what I did is I figured out a zero line speed run where I was trying to get to a line connecting two different vowels of zero Edo as quickly as possible because it make thing it makes things kind of glitch out a lot in a really cool way. Yeah, and I was the the motivation behind <laughs> this side That's because That's the only context in which I will accept zero Edo. <laughs> uh because it all started with uh my short meme video where I uh, speed run the diagram of uh, projective tuning space. Yeah, getting from 3 Edo, 4 Edo, 5 Edo, and 12 Edo to 323 Edo, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or like 171, uh, one of those ones. Yeah. Making interactive diagrams is a really good idea. I'm going to do that now. I got interactive diagrams on my to-do list still. Nice. I would love to see and interact with those. Yeah. Uh, Dead Shaman, we were in conversation now maybe years ago about... Uh, yeah, I was trying to figure out how to create a search function for some of the SVGs of like auto reading um, numbers and just could could not because I know software that I could have access to um, could could process all of it with enough resolution, at least. You know, before we end the podcast, we need to let Ground talk about the buckle shoe. Oh, yeah. What is that? Uh, thank you for bringing this up. I totally forgot about it. So, <laughs> so there's this meme going around about a guy who is basically showing off his new six shoes, except they have like leprechaun buckles or like the kind of buckles that you'd see on pilgrim shoes. And he sings one, two buckle my shoe. And the notation, um, the intonation of that was very interesting to me. And I was so intrigued by it that I decided to transcribe the melody. In order to do that, I first had to find out what tuning it was in. So I put the audio file into Reaper and played over each note on repeat while putting scent values into scale workshop and testing them to make sure that they're perfectly in tune. Then I took all of that and put it into my spreadsheet to find the best approximations of those intervals. And I found that 28 Edo was pretty much the best that I could get in that size range. And so I transcribed it into 28 Edo. And then I got a little carried away and I turned it into a whole produced you know 12 second song and now it's on my tumblr because i it's not good enough to post anywhere else <laughs> okay guys guys we're 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 listening to it right now bro come over here come over here check out my new shoes they're the brand new one two That is so fire! <laughs> okay, that is sick. I love that. that. Mm -hmm. Well done. Incredible. Bravo. Bravo. That was fantastic. Wow. Thanks. I'm glad people like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds really good to me as well. And I am also working on something in 28 Edo. I just recently decided it should be in 28 Edo because at first it was going to be in 14 Edo. But what happened, this is like the first thing that I made when I got Reaper. But then I deleted the original project and then I tried to remake it only to find out that I prefer the original version over the remake. But there's some parts of the remake that I kind of like, but they are on different reference pitches. The original is on... C261.62 blah 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 and it's in the it's in the key of that a neutral thing um but the remake is has the reference pitch of a and it's in the key of like the a flat one step of 14 you know, below a 
So the remake literally sounds darker, both tonally and pitch-wise. But what I've decided now is I'm going to start on, like, the, the pitch that the remake's at, then, like, go up one step of 28 Edo to, like, the, the middle section when, like, most of the drums come in so that it all brightens up. And then what I can do is I can employ some other harmony that 28 Edo has in there. But I haven't worked on it because I've been so busy editing the last podcast episode, moving my Reaper sessions to an SSD drive, um, setting up a new desk that I got yesterday, and distracting myself with you can probably guess what. <laughs> I really hate when that happens, when you make a remake of one of your songs and you actually prefer the original. I have this song that I wrote when I was like 16 and I recently made a remake of it because that song means a lot to me. And it made it very apparent how much edgier my music is compared to how it used to be. The stuff that I wrote as a teenager was so sentimental and pretty, and I miss that. Mm -hmm. Same. I miss yeah. not being jaded. That that is a that is a loaded way to say that, but uh, it's accurate, I guess. I guess not loaded. I don't know what term I'm using. I don't know what my brain is doing. I I'm an alien. I'm I'm addicted to weird things. I'm an alien. Just just leave me alone. It's not loaded. It's bloated because I said too much. Speaking of saying too much, one of the last things I wanted to mention on the podcast because we are at like two and a half hours now is the fact that I just recently finished my honors project at my college, and I thought about this because Kagrodens mentioned uh, an honors paper earlier in the podcast and my honors project was to use an FPGA to take MIDI signals, interpret them and turn them into a visualization that is output through a composite video signal for which I designed the circuitry myself. And the 12 Edo Halberstadt keyboard that I had didn't output a standard MIDI signal for some reason. So what I did was I took my Axis 49 and just plugged it into my computer and used my audio interfaces MIDI out to plug that into my circuit. And I additionally used the Axis 49 in all of my documentation and my competition demonstration. So now that is just going to be out there forever. So if you ever see an FPGA MIDI visualizer running on a Monster High karaoke machine with an Axis 49, you'll know who it is. Nice. 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 Yeah. I didn't want to break any of my high-end CRTs, so I, I used a Monster High karaoke machine. Let's go. Watch us uh, not edit out any any of what we're saying right now. And so we talk about how we chose such a perfect place to end the podcast. Let me keep talking. Let me keep talking. Let me keep talking. Let me keep talking. I miss just being the way that I was a few years ago. I miss all of the things in my life that have hardened me and made me afraid to follow the goals that I've set for myself. <laughs> insert, insert cricket samples followed by a reverb fart. <laughs> it's like cricket sounds. <laughs>